All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to a regular meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, if we could please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so we get started. We got some recognition tonight. Yes, we do. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Allison Rushforth to help lead us through it. Thank you very much. During the 2019-2020 school year, PACE, the Parent Association for Special Education, facilitated a meeting with Special Olympics New York and our secondary school was designated as a unified champion school. The Special Olympics Unified Champion Schools program is aimed at promoting social inclusion through intentionality, planned and implemented activities, affecting system-wide change. With sports as the foundation, the three component model offers a unique combination of effective activities that equip young people with the tools and training to create sports, classroom and school climates of acceptance. This school climate is where students with disabilities feel welcome and are routinely included in and feel a part of all activities, opportunities and functions. It is my pleasure to recognize the Unified Sports Club advisor, Melissa Slobin and the coach, Gerard Fay, who every day demonstrate the qualities of inclusive leadership and commitment of acceptance. Please welcome Ms. Slobin and Ms. Gutierrez. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Posse, Ms. Rushforth, uh, our administration, and of course, our Board of Ed for acknowledging our uh, Special Olympics Club, um, a great bunch of kids, uh, both on the basketball court. They do great things in the classroom. The kids that are involved in our club are involved in so many different things in school, and they make a difference. And then, of course, there's, there's my guys who um, make my day. I, I'm sure I can speak for Ms. Slobin that they make the difference in my day. I've been with them for a number of years in the classroom and to see them grow and evolve and just walk the hallways like they own the place and to see their schoolmates greet them. I love being a fly on their wall. It, it, it really is a lot of fun. Um, the club itself is, it's been around for how many years for us? 2019, you said, but we've been active for three years. Ms. Slobin took me on as a basketball coach just a couple of years ago, and it's been fantastic. It's so much fun. The club itself, each year we're adding another thing or two, another event or two that we're getting involved in, and it's growing more and more. There's more kids, there's more general ed kids around the school that are, that are getting involved and, and helping out. And inclusivity is the word. It's fantastic to see general ed kids and, and the special ed kids just mix like they're all one, which, which they are. And happy Down Syndrome Awareness Day. So um, we have some certificates. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into it. I'll still Okay, so what was the date? February 3rd, uh, we participated in the uh, Polar Plunge for that raised money for uh, the New York chapter of the Special Olympics. The, Spe the Special Olympics is the driving force behind the Unified Sports Club and team. So without their funds, we wouldn't exist. So we were happy to raise money for them and uh, 
I really can't believe I went in the water being that <laughs> <laughs> I don't normally swim even if it's 90 degrees out. But for this cause, um, I was happy to take the plunge along with uh, some of our students. So uh, so Coach Bay, I, I, I want to take some of the pressure off of Ms. Slovin. The polar plunge was my idea. <laughs> Each year now we've gone to an uh, inclusivity uh, conference at Plainish High School and Special Olympics New York is there with a whole list of different things to get involved in. And I thought the polar plunge was simple enough to organize. We really started it late. There was a lot of other schools that were ahead of us, but we got after it and had great contributions from everybody in the community, both in school and out. Our kids did a fantastic job raising money. And there's a trophy over there in the corner that we won for being the top earning school at the event. Okay, without, yes, I did, I did. Yes, we did. It was a crazy hour waiting to be called to go in, but 15 minutes before they called us, I stopped shivering. I got so comfortable, it was great, it was great. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, these four students, these four brave souls, out of all of us, they were all, all of the kids, they were the ones that jumped in the water with us. Please come on up and be recognized. Isabella Chalowski. Declan Gann. Ryan Krug. Ryan Lombard. Everybody else that I'm about to recognize uh, is a very crucial part of our club, our classroom, our sport, and they helped and did a fantastic job fundraising as well. Luca Buschletta. Maddie Salura. Jonathan Diaz. Victoria Gipp. I don't believe he's here, but we'll announce him anyway. He deserves a recognition. It's Aiden O. Annie Lynch. Uh, another team and club member who deserves the recognition but is not here is Michael Sforza. And uh, not here as well, but still deserving is Cole Thorpe. I'm sure. Can I just finish up? Okay. Yeah. I also just wanted to uh, give a shout out, a huge thank you to you, Gerard Fay, special education teacher assistant, who has really been a driving force behind the success of our club and team. Um, it really takes a village. And somehow in 10 days, we raised over $8,000. So thank you again. Um, and uh, Gerard, Gerard and I would also like to thank the following staff members who came out on that Saturday morning, that cold and windy morning in February at North Hempstead Beach. They cheered, they took pictures, they held our towels <laughs> all on their own time. So thank you, teaching assistants, Angela Barba,
Tommy happy. Nicole Kopetic. Mary Pagonis. Maria Spathis. And a thank you also to special education teacher, Nicole Fay, wife of Coach Fay, <laughs> who came out to cheer with their daughter, Savannah. Thank you so much. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, the fact that all, those of you who jumped in, I can't even imagine. When was that date that it was? February 3rd. Yeah. A warm, a warm February 3rd? Yeah. <laughs> no. Guys, uh, for the students and some of the students, this isn't the first time we've seen them up here. And it's just uh, always remarkable to see what you guys are doing within the school, within the community. So I tip my hat to all of you and your parents. Uh, so I'm going to give you an option. You're more than welcome to stay. Um, we have a very exciting presentation tonight, but if you would like to go home and work on your homework or have dinner with your parents and celebrate, that's option B. So that's your choice. Staying. All right, great. All right. So we do have a, um, quorum tonight and, uh, approval of minutes all in favor. Great. And that leads us to the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, happy spring to everyone. So uh, I want to begin my report by extending my congratulations to our fine and performing arts department. Last week, the high school's drama production of You Can't Take It With You was remarkable. The students had the audience smiling and laughing in their seats, and I want to congratulate the cast and their advisors um, on an incredible production. Uh, in the same department, last night was our annual Pops concert, the talent, dedication, and hard work of our students and teachers involved was truly remarkable and always a joy to witness. We've received some exciting news. Uh, the Student Television Network Convention held in California announced the winners of the Broadcast Excellence Awards, their highest honors of the year. The Broadcast Excellence Awards honors student-produced high school broadcasting programs that meet a standard of excellence. Our broadcasting program submitted two entries, one for the high school weekly news show and one for high school podcasts. And I'm so pleased to announce that we won the Outstanding Achievement Award for each submission. And we can now say that we have another nationally recognized program at our secondary school. So congratulations to our students and to Dr. Coleman, their dedicated teacher. I'll invite them all for a recognition um, at a future meeting. So uh, let me transition to provide an update on construction. As you know, the voters approved a bond referendum in December of 2022 for $44 million. Uh, one of the projects included in the bond is the reconstruction of the baseball field. The construction crews have made good progress on the baseball field project. The field is ready and has been in use. Yesterday, the crews completed the concrete work and are continuing the preparation of the asphalt around the uh, field. We expect the asphalt to be complete tomorrow, 
and the entire facility to be ready for the first home scrimmage game on Monday. With respect to the interior doors and hardware project, work has begun at Shelter Rock. And as a reminder, uh, they'll install doors uh, at Muncie Park next and then at the secondary school. At the last meeting, I discussed the fact that our summer projects are still in the queue to be reviewed by the State Education Department. The review process has been excruciatingly long as over summer, um, as, uh, as our summer projects were submitted in September for review. Uh, over the last two weeks, the State Education Department architects reviewed 220 projects and their engineers reviewed 121. That is promising if they keep this pace, our projects would be reviewed in time to commence this summer. So I'll keep you updated. And as I said, our district's architect is uh, hard at work at making sure that our uh, approvals come in on time. But just to be clear, large scale capital projects that are supported by the issuance of debt uh, do not impact the district's tax levy calculation and does not impact the ability to fund other items in the general fund budget. They are standalone items uh, approved by the voters that must be completed in accordance with that, uh, with that vote. So just to be clear. So um, next, let me transition to give you an update on our initiative to recover COVID related expenses from FEMA. We have recovered $475,000 thus far this year. And I'm pleased to report that, we're, that we were informed that an incremental $882,000 reimbursement was just approved. Um, this is in addition to the $366,000 that we recovered and accrued last year, bringing our total recoveries to date to a remarkable $1.7 million. FEMA has informed us that we are one of only two districts that are actively pursuing this reimbursement. I'm sure that's because of how laborious the process is. Uh, these are one-time funds, and in the budget presentation, I'll discuss potential uses of these funds, um, but just as a reminder, they can't be used for reoccurring expenses. So in addition, an incremental $2.7 million was presented to FEMA last month and is pending review. And once we hear about that, I'll update the board on the status. So uh, speaking of budget, in a few minutes, I will once again present the superintendent's preliminary budget for the board's consideration. While the preliminary budget accomplishes our primary goals, the reality of our fiscal climate requires us to make some difficult decisions to reduce expenses by over $1 million to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap. We have strived to limit staff reductions to comply with the state's property tax cap. However, the reality is that compensation and benefits make up 75% of our budget. Given the universal stressors on school district finances for 24-25, Manhasset is not unique in its need to reorganize and reduce certain staff positions to achieve a balanced budget that accomplishes our primary goals. These goals include lowering class size K-12, expanding academic course offerings, continuing to upgrade our facilities, enhancing technology, boosting security staffing in all of our buildings, and of course, supporting student wellness. Accomplishing these goals does not alleviate the distress caused by these reductions that we all feel. It is critically important to acknowledge the valuable contributions of our teaching assistants, and I would be remiss if I didn't once again publicly acknowledge these contributions and also acknowledge the stress of these reductions on those impacted. So that's my report. I will go into my budget more detail in my budget presentation later on in the, um, in the agenda. Thank you. Uh, any questions? All right. And Grillo is, he's confident that we're still on a timeline that we can get some approval for these summer projects? He's, uh, I would say he's hopeful. And um, what we've seen in terms of the pace of the approval from the architects and engineering at SED this last week has been promising. Okay. And then in regards to the uh, 882,000 that was just approved, any idea when we potentially would see that? We should see we we uh, should see that soon. The uh, the funds typically are deposited within five to seven days. Right. And that two point the two point one million that was recently submitted. That's we're just waiting right now. There's no. It's gone through the yes. It's gone through the initial review process, and now that it's been submitted to FEMA, um, if they when they have additional questions and additional um, inquiries, we'll we'll address them. All right. Great. So, oh, student delegate report, what do you got?
So at tonight's meeting, we work to further plan the club fair, which will take place May 29th. In addition, the Student Senate discussed a resolution to redistribute funds from the class of 2020, 21, 22, and 23, which have remaining funds in their extracurricular accounts. Since the student treasurers are no longer present at Manhattan High School, the Student Senate resolution redistributes the funds among the classes of 25, 26, and 27 equally. Thank you. And with the, I know last time you were talking about the voter registration, is that something, has there been any update on that or did that run? Yeah, it took place last week. Okay, success? Yes, successful. All right, great. Uh, and any, um, any more word on the school in regards to the student mascot vote that was out there? She's on the, um, she said it went well. So. Well, well. <laughs> Thank you and your team. I appreciate it. Good. Can I just ask a quick question? Go right ahead. The funds that get redistributed, can you just give an example of what what kinds of things those funds get used for that you, the classes raise? What were they going towards? Yeah, like not specifically, but just in general, when you guys raise money, what kinds of activities do, or what are they? What is the fund? It came from it, it came from like raising money for prom, um, just class events from like each school year. So it goes to fund those events, or what is it used for? Those kind of goes, events, yeah, it like goes student activities. Yeah, student okay. activities. All right, thank you. I know last year's graduating class, they had a, a gift to the school, and that was to put their money towards whatever the new mascot may be, something to represent that. So is that something that, was that redistributed, or is that in a special holder for that class for when the, uh, the mascot's taken care of? If the funds are going to the mascot, the last the the class gift last year. I'm just because you're, you're yeah, talking about how it was redistributed. So the class gift last year was to take their funds and to put it towards whatever the new mascot is to build a, a statue or something with that those funds. So I'm just asking, was that were those funds hold held because of that gift or were they part of the redistribution? They're held totally. Okay, great, just perfect, and. You have to run, right? Big outfit. Right. Understandable. Thank you so much, Sophia. All right, so you're up. All right, uh, James, can you put up the uh, PowerPoint for us? Okay. We good? Okay, thank you so much. So tonight we have our first informal budget hearing. I plan to go through the preliminary budget again for the board's consideration. And after my presentation, we'll take questions from the board. And then of course the public hearing portion will begin from the community and we'll take questions from the community. So tonight's presentation is designed as follows. We'll review the budget development timeline. We'll review the district priority areas, our 24-25 budget goals. We'll provide an overview of our expenditures. We're going to discuss the current revenue climate. We'll outline the steps we've taken to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap. And of course, review projected elementary class size. As I said previously, we'll also have an opportunity for question and answers. For ease, we've included links to each of these presentations for the community to review. The presentation will be posted on the website, but each of these were, the, uh, were part of the budget development timeline. So each step of the budget development process is focused on the development of the district's learner profile. The learner profile is built on the foundation of our mission and vision, which serves as our guidepost through the, through the, throughout this process. With the learner profile in mind, we develop the budget based on our instructional program goals, which emphasize robust academic pathways. As you know, our instructional program is incredibly successful and Manhasset is in a position of tremendous strength. Last year, 90% of our secondary school students graduated with an advanced regents diploma, the highest diploma type offered by New York State. They wrote 1,500 advanced placement exams and our school was recognized by the College Board for our access and success rate in our AP program. All three of our schools have been recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as national blue ribbon schools. Along with the learner profile, the district's priority areas identify the goals of the 24-25 budget. 
Our priority areas include to strengthen academic and extracurricular experiences, invest in facilities, enhance professional development, and to forge strong connections. We've crafted a budget that manages the complexities of a challenging financial environment. Our budget development goals include the following, support the district's priority areas, preserve strong academic programs K-12 with a particular focus on class size, expand academic offerings at the secondary school, maintain and upgrade our aging facilities infrastructure, enhance our instructional technology infrastructure and instructional software, bolster security staffing in all three schools, maintain and enhance support for the social and emotional wellness of students, and of course, operate within the property tax cap. We are committed to fiscal responsibility, and this budget reflects that commitment, to, uh, namely to operate within the allowable property tax cap. This year, our preliminary 3.3% budget to budget increase totaling $3.5 million is within the 2.68% property tax cap for 24-25. As I said previously, it's important to note that more than $1 million of necessary reductions were taken in order to comply with the tax cap. Since my initial budget presentation, a question was received asking how the size of our budget compares to other Nassau County districts with similar enrollments. This slide shows the size of our 23-24 budget compared to the budgets of other select Nassau County districts. I looked at seven districts with larger enrollment than ours and seven districts with fewer students than ours. You can see that the average enrollment of these 15 districts, including Manhasset, was approximately 3,000 students, and the average budget was approximately 10 million more than Manhasset's. Manhasset's 23-24 budget per pupil is approximately 10% lower than the average of these other districts. You'll see that I've highlighted a few of the other high achieving districts for comparison. And with this in mind, we should acknowledge how much we have, how much we've achieved programmatically with a smaller average budget than our peers. Not sure what happened there, James. Oh, thank you. So let's understand why this is. Why is Manhasset's, why is Manhasset's budget on average $10 million less than some of the other uh, budgets of our comparators? So to understand why the size of our budget is what it is in comparison to other districts, we need to examine historical budget to budget increases as each budget builds the foundation for future years. Prior to 2009-10, you can see the level of budget to budget increases the district had each year. In 2009-10, because of the Wall Street financial crisis, which significantly impacted Manhasset residents, it was determined to put forth a zero budget increase. The 0.87% shown on this chart accounts for only $700,000 of new debt service with no other budget increase. In the context of the time, this was a well-reasoned decision. Had we had the ability to add a typical incremental 2% increase in the budget, it would have yielded an incremental increase of about $1.6 million. In 2012-13, the property tax cap was enacted, leading to a limited tax levy of $119,000 in 13-14 on an $87 million budget. This insufficient increase would have required a budget decrease of $2.3 million to the 2012-13 budget amount. Therefore, the district sought voter approval to pierce the tax cap. That budget failed to receive the necessary voter approval, resulting in a contingent budget with a $900,000 decrease from the 12-13 budget, which was approved. However, Instead of having a normal budget increase of, the, um, of about $2.2 million, the result was a $3.1 million negative swing. The cumulative impact of the 2009-10 zero budget increase and the 13-14 budget to budget decrease has had a seismic effect on our budgets in the ensuing years. The reality is, <clears throat> if these two events had not occurred, 
the 23-24 budget would be approximately $6.1 million higher than it is today. Obviously, an incremental $6.1 million in our budget would bring us still below the average, uh, but much closer to similarly sized Nassau County districts included in the prior chart. But aside from the impact on any individual budget, such erosion has other long-term impacts. Astoundingly, if the two events in 2009-10 and 13-14 had not occurred, the district would have had available incremental budgeted funds totaling 67 million over those 15 years. On that note, let's pivot to the second question we have received. Why doesn't the district have more money in its reserves? <coughs> in addition to the events I previously noted, since the district adopted a tax cap mentality in 2009-10, well before the actual imposition of the property tax cap law, the average budget to budget increase over the past 15 years was 1.98%. During the period from 9-10 through 12-13, the district used reserves of at least $1 million each year to blunt the effect of the zero budget to budget increase of 2009-10. An anticipated reduction in debt services in 1314 was meant to replace the use of those reserves. Unfortunately, the rules of the tax cap disallowed that strategy because debt service is an exclusion in the tax cap calculation. Therefore, the district's reliance on reserves to bridge the gap in those prior years further compounded issues in 1314. The erosion of the budget foundation in 910 and 1314, along with an average budget to budget increase of 1.98%, especially when viewed through the line through the lens of the steep rise in certain costs, such as benefits over the last several years, set the stage for an incredibly tight budget process that leaves very little money left over in any school year to fund reserves. I think you would agree that our reserve picture would have looked significantly different had the district had the incremental budgeted funds over the period totaling $67 million. Generally, we have placed any leftover money in our capital reserves for use on large scale capital projects in the years bet between bond issuances as shown on this slide. I'd also like to point out that we had designated fund balance in 2019-2020 uh, for COVID related expenses for 2020-2021. And as I've mentioned on several occasions, we're actively seeking reimbursement from FEMA. And as I said previously to date, we've recovered 1.4 million of that amount. And uh, an additional incremental 2.7 million was presented to FEMA last month and is pending review. Our initiative to recover these funds has neutralized the impact of the governor's proposed $629,000 reduction in state aid, which we will discuss later on in the presentation. It's also allowed us to make one-time purchases to limit the reductions necessary in the 24-25 budget to enable, us, uh, to enable our compliance with the 24-25 property tax cap. So with that background in mind, let's pivot to the 24-25 budget. The budget for each, for each year is intended to stand on its own. In each year, the amount of the allowable budget increase is defined for us by the property tax cap calculation. As a reminder, in 24-25, the property tax cap allows for a net increase of $3.5 million. As I stated previously, more than $1 million of necessary reductions were taken in order for us to comply with the tax cap. Staffing accounts for 75% of our budget. Special education services other than compensation account for 5% of the budget. And 20% of the budget is made up of all other expenditures. Within the 75% that includes compensation and benefits, certain non-discretionary components are dictated by our collective bargaining agreements. Special education costs are mandated as determined by a child's individual education plan. And while certain components of staffing are non-discretionary, certain elements of staffing are discretionary. For example, class size is discretionary, course offerings are discretionary, and certain support staff assignments are discretionary. So let's take a closer look at the 75% of the budget that is compensation and benefits. Very significant drivers included in this year's budget include all active and retiree health care costs 
and pension contributions, all of which have percentage increases that are in the double digits in a 2% tax cap environment. 25% of the overall budget is benefits, yet the increase in benefits takes up 36% of the 24-25 budget increase. We've managed this impact in part with certain staff reductions, which we will discuss later in the presentation, totaling a net impact of more than $800,000. This represents minus 0.75% of the budget increase. So with our priority areas in mind, let's talk about what is included in the expenditure side of the budget. The budget preserves our strong elementary program with a particular focus on class size, which I will detail later on in the presentation. Over the past several years, we have made significant investments in staffing to support students and teachers. This slide includes staffing levels for general education specialists, academic support teachers, enrichment, and staff development at the elementary level. The investment in academic support teachers ensures that students who require additional attention through either pullout or push-in services receive that support. In addition, our math and reading specialists provide push-in support to teachers to assist in the differentiation of instruction. Our math specialists teach our double accelerated math students. Our science and computer specialists provide valuable curricular and enrichment experiences. Our literacy, our literacy coaches provide ongoing staff development, including the differentiation of instruction to support our robust reading and writing program, K-6. Our investment in specialists combined with the diligent work of our faculty and staff alongside our investment in curriculum development has paid off. As you'll recall from our, from our data presentations, student achievement has increased at all levels. And most remarkably can be seen in double digit increases in SAT scores and significant increases in successful participation in our advanced placement program. This year, we changed our elementary co-teaching model to include a special education teacher in the classroom throughout the day with the general education teacher. In the previous model, the special education teacher was in the classroom for two and a half hours a day, and the remaining part of the day was covered by a teaching assistant. This change reflects a best practice model. And given the overall positive feedback from our teachers, we're continuing this model next year. Ms. Rushworth and her team will be hosting a presentation for parents on the ICT model on April 2nd at 6.30 p.m. We encourage any parents who have questions about this model to attend that meeting. At the secondary school, the budget supports lowered class size with additional teachers added to social studies, English, mathematics, and world language. Expansion of classes based on student enrollment in advanced placement and support classes, and the expansion of course offerings to include AP Macroeconomics, Virtual Enterprise, which is an exciting new course that includes workplace simulation that is students completing market research, writing business plans, designing and implementing a website, managing payroll, and developing an annual report. We are reintroducing a course in business law, and we're starting a new world language pathway in Mandarin. The budget also supports the expansion of the science research program from eight periods a day to nine periods a day, allowing for the separation of advanced one and advanced two research students and an increased section of our senior course STS prep, which prepares kids for Regeneron um, competitions. In addition, the expansion of engineering classes is the result of a higher rate of retention in the engineering pathway. As you know, we requested a security review from the Nassau County Homeland Security Department. Uh, among their recommendations are additional security guards at each elementary school with a focus on perimeter security. This budget includes the addition of these positions. In addition, we're adding a full-time TA to the Middle School Wellness Center to support the various programmatic initiatives that are taking place in that space. So as we previously discussed, 75% of the budget consists of compensation and benefits. However, only 56% of the budget increase relates to compensation and benefits. 25% of the 24-25 budget drives 44% of the budget increase. Let's discuss why. So let's go into detail on each of these categories listed on this slide. 
First, with respect to transportation, you'll note a decrease in contract transportation. This is due to efficiencies in route configuration and will not impact after school bus runs. With respect to special education, the primary expense driver is the increase in the number of and cost of out of district placements. In addition, we've budgeted for the new unfunded mandate that requires us to educate special education students through their 22nd year. Um, our increase would have been less $181,000 had this not been mandated. In addition, contract therapists provide services to students with an IEP that include assistive technology, occupational therapy, nursing services, and auditory and visual therapy. The cost of these services increased 18% in 23 24 and are budgeted to increase 11% in 24 25. This represents a 30% increase over two years on a line item that now totals 1.85 million. This slide focuses on information technology other than compensation. Importantly, the budget continues to support our equipment rotation program. This is critically important because as you know, technology is an integral part of our instructional program. The Teachers College Reading and Writing Project is now fully funded um, and is now fully adapted and blends the workshop model with the science of reading. We are emphasizing a shift towards leveraging in-house professional development through our literacy coaches rather than external training through Teachers College. So funding is allocated for the purchase of units of study that have been adapt updated to reflect the science of reading. Additionally, funding supports the purchase of materials for programs such as Just Words, Read 180, and K-12 Foundations. In addition, we're including funding for targeted professional development to support our integrated co-teaching program. Funding for curriculum development is also maintained. We've included funding for various curriculum development projects, including those necessary to support the continued transition to the next generation learning standards, our new courses, and the addition of the Project Lead the Way units at the elementary level. One of our district's goals centers around facilities. The budget continues to provide funds for the long-term investment in improving our facilities. Uh, this foundational money allows us to complete projects as identified. As an example, we're budgeting for the second grade classroom redesign, continuing our commitment to refresh our elementary classroom spaces. You will note a decrease in the facilities budget due to savings that are anticipated in electricity and natural gas as a result of the 2023 EPC. Solar panels, lights, and boiler replacement projects are scheduled to be completed in the end of the summer, 2024. And as we discussed at our last meeting, this is a vulnerability in the budget because we are, uh, we are not certain as to when the solar panels will be hooked up to PSE&G. However, we are taking the savings uh, in order to ensure that we're not uh, vulnerable in other areas. Uh, we don't have to make reductions in other areas of the budget. So repair and maintenance, the repair and maintenance budget is maintained, the security camera rotation, including the purchase of license, uh, license plate reader cameras is included. So the budget reflects the current and anticipated interest rates on the tax anticipation note. In 23-24, the district borrowed 7 million and anticipates the same in 24-25. There is an offset to this expense and the increase in the interest revenue. The 24-25 budget also includes the next level of debt issuance pursuant to the 2022 bond referendum. Because the bond referendum was previously approved by the voters, the debt service related to the new issuance is exempt from the tax levy calculation. With respect to pupil services, the increase in expense is due to the fully funding of our partnership with Northwell Health. Uh, this initiative was originally funded in 22-23 through a COVID-related grant, and it's now fully funded in 24-25. The partnership allows the district to partner with a variety of community resources in mental and behavioral health and overall wellness services and supports and provides guidance and resources in all areas of mental health and social and emotional learning. So as a reminder, 75% of the budget is made up of compensation and benefits. Yet 56% of the budget increase is made up of compensation and benefits. 
to present a balanced budget within the property tax cap, we've made staff reductions that have reduced compensation by a net of $806,000 plus related benefits that include a net reduction in health insurance of $251,000. And as I've said repeatedly, more than $1 million was necessary to be taken out of the budget in order to comply with the property tax cap. And as you know, any reduction in staff is difficult as these reductions reflect real people. With 75% of the budget made up of staffing costs, we had to make some difficult decisions to achieve a balanced budget. The preliminary budget reflects a reduction of 14.45 full-time equivalent positions. I'll go into the details of these reductions in the coming slides. So as we discussed from the, outs from the outset, this budget is crafted in the context of a very challenging fiscal environment. We examined our staffing assignments with an emphasis on lowering class size, primarily through staffing efficiencies. We added 3.0 elementary teachers to lower class size in grades five and six. I'll go into details of this later on in the presentation. We added 2.5 secondary teachers to lower class size, support curriculum ex expansion, and manage increased enrollment in certain departments. Given the challenge fiscal environment, we are recommending that 3.5 teachers on special assignment be returned to the classroom to help absorb the impact of the staffing additions I previously outlined. This is the reorganization of staffing that I was discussing previously. 4.1 teachers are reduced due to student enrollment and efficiencies in scheduling. Uh, I'm sorry, let me go back up here for a second. The chart on this slide <laughs> outlines the teachers on special assignment positions that would be returned to traditional teaching positions. The IT staff developer positions. <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> the IT staff developer positions were originally expanded to support teachers with hybrid instruction. Since then, they've trained teachers on Canvas and other technology platforms, and they've been a truly valuable resource. That training would revert to lead teachers, to the director of te technology, and to Nassau BOCES. With respect to the assistive technology role, that position would revert to contract therapists from BOCES. This slide outlines the reduction to teacher assistants that are recommended. Let's go through each one. As I stated previously, we've changed our elementary integrated co-teaching model. This change has led to a reduction of 10.0 budgeted elementary classroom teaching assistants. This year, we have 24 classroom teaching assistants budgeted of which 22 of those positions are filled. Next year, we'll have 14 positions budgeted at the elementary school to support students with individual education plans that require a teaching assistant. As we discussed previously, the change in our ICT model has the special education teacher in the classroom throughout the day. This model was piloted this year. The previous model that we ran last year and in years prior to that had split the support for students with disabilities between a special education teacher and a teaching assistant. And as I said, certain ICT classes next year will continue to have a TA assigned based on the needs of particular students. The next set of reductions are recommended because of the realities of our fiscal climate and the necessity of reducing positions to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap. It saddens us to recommend removing the elementary computer lab TA positions the elementary library TA positions, the secondary school library TA positions, and one secondary school department departmental TA. The remaining departmental TAs at the secondary school will be reassigned to ensure coverage for all departments. So now that we've discussed the expenditure side of the budget, let's take a moment to review the revenue side of the budget. The district has three primary sources of revenue. State aid, which accounts for 5%, various other sources, which account for 4%, property taxes account for 90%, and the appropriated fund balance, which accounts for 1%. As we stated earlier, 
Each year we receive from the Office of Real Property Services a growth factor that tells us the value by which the tax base in the community has been adjusted as a result of new construction. This year, that new construction is valued at $349,000. By comparison, last year, it was valued at $725,000. So we've seen a, uh, we've seen a reduction, I'm sorry, $708,000. We expect to see an increase in revenue from boundary properties by $45,000. Interest earnings are projected to increase by an estimated $525,000. And sadly, the governor's proposed budget includes a reduction of $629,000 in foundation aid for our district, which represents a stunning 20.7% decrease, decrease in foundation aid. The state legislature is set to vote on the governor's proposed budget on April 1st. We've written and spoken to our local representatives. Uh, they have they share our concern, and we've urged them to advocate on our behalf for full restoration. This budget assumes the restoration of state aid. Should the restoration not occur, we will appropriate the difference in fund balance through our FEMA recoveries. We certainly hope a full restoration occurs, as the risk of appropriating fund balance is that it creates a significant cliff for the 25-26 budget and beyond if state aid is not restored. You'll see the assumed reduction, I'm sure, sorry, you'll see the assumed restoration in state aid on this slide. In addition, you'll note that we're recommending increasing the assigned fund balance to remain within the property tax cap. This is opposed to impacting our educational program with incremental reductions. The risk is that the 24-25 budget must produce the same amount of fund balance for sustainability moving forward to 25-26. So let's review the steps we've taken to achieve a balanced budget within the property tax cap in a very difficult fiscal environment. We've created efficiencies in staffing that are necessary in this fiscal environment. We've reduced various discretionary spending lines. We will pre-purchase supplies and textbooks from 23-24 funds to reduce supply codes in 24-25. And again, that will come from our FEMA restoration. Should state foundation aid not be restored, which we certainly hope is not the case, we've recommended that we appropriate, appropriate fund balance generated as a result of our FEMA recoveries to cover the $629,000 potential reduction. We've recommended that we increase the amount of the appropriated fund balance to achieve a balanced budget to $840,000. And as an aside, the unfunded mandate to change our team name is not budgeted. Fund balance generated as a result of FEMA recoveries from 2324 will be used to cover expenses required to change our team name. In all instances, the use of fund balance generated in 2324 is only made possible by our initiative to recover COVID-related expenses from FEMA. So let's examine and go into the details of elementary class size. Historically, the district utilizes the class size guidelines on this slide. The board subcommittee to discuss our guidelines has done a great deal of work and we anticipate a recommendation that affirms the class size guidelines are reasonable but efforts should be made to maintain classes below the recommended guidelines when practical. And we've heard similar um, feedback from our teachers. The budget has been dealt, has been built with this recommendation in mind. So I just wanna take a few minutes to review how we project class size. The projected class size for kindergarten is based on the average live birth data from Nassau County. Class sizes for grades one through six include the projected cohort changes using trend analysis that includes an examination of three, five, and seven year average cohort changes. We track how many kids come in, how many kids leave, and what the net impact is. And we've tracked that data for several years since 2005, six. And we use that to project what we anticipate will be the class size. Importantly, in the projections that I'm going to show you, all elementary sections are below class size guidelines, including the projected cohort change. We have specifically added 3.0 teachers to reduce class size in grades five and six. 
and we will closely monitor class size throughout the summer. And as, I, as we do every year, final section determinations will be made in August based on actual enrollment at the time. So let's talk about Muncie Park. The average enrollment over 13 years at Muncie Park is 876 students. You will note that enrollment is declining over the last five years from its height of 934 students in 2019 to 815 students predicted in 24-25. The average number of sections is 41. This year we're projecting to be at 40 sections primarily because we have added 2.0 full-time equivalent teachers to reduce class size in grades five and six. So now let's dig deeper into the class size projections. In this slide, we're moving from bed stay data, which is measured in October to the most recent enrollment information as of the end of February. You'll note that all classes are projected to be below guidelines. In grade five, 146 students would typically be placed in six sections with an average class size of 24.3. In grade six, 151 students would typically be placed in six sections with an average class size of 25.1. Again, we have added two full-time equivalent teachers here to be consistent with the subcommittee's anticipated recommendation and the feedback we've received from our teachers to remain below the class size guidelines. So now let's look at Shelter Rock. The average enrollment is 689 students over 13 years. There is a significant decline in enrollment from its height of 777 students in 2013-2014. Next year's enrollment is projected to be 607 students, the lowest in the last 13 years. On average, we have 32 sections. Next year, we are projecting 31. Once again, in this slide, you'll see that all class sizes are projected to be below guidelines in Shelter Rock. In grade five, we would typically plan for four sections with 100 students currently enrolled. This would be a grade that we would watch and we would wait until August to determine if an additional section was necessary. However, to be consistent with the subcommittee's recommendation and with the request that we've heard from our teachers, we've already made grade five, five sections reflecting a class size of 20. If the predicted enrollment change occurs, three sections will be at 21. Our upcoming budget meetings are listed here. All meetings will be in the district office. One important note, um, starting April 22nd, 2024, early mail, uh, early mail applications can be found on the Manhasset's website under the Board of Education Voter Information tab. Early mail ballot applications must be received by May 14th to the Manhasset District Clerk. And as you'll see here, we have an informal budget hearing scheduled for April 4th. The budget presentation and adoption of the budget is scheduled for April 16th. That is the budget that will be put forward to voters. Um, there's a formal budget hearing that is required by law to occur on May 9th. And then the annual budget vote will occur from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the high school gym. Um, I just wanna clarify one other uh, question that came up last year, I'm sorry, last meeting. At the last meeting, a question was asked about how many households there are in Manhasset and how many of those households um, have children that attend school here. Um, we have uh, well over 5,000 households in Manhasset and uh, of those, um, 1,760 send students to the district. Um, the number that I gave at the last meeting was much higher. I'll take the board's questions. Thank you very much. Who would like to ask some questions? The redhead on it. Thank you, Dr. Posse. Uh, in order for us to understand how you crafted this budget, and I understand it was very difficult in doing so, um, is it possible to give us uh, a lens of how you approached some avenues in terms of clearly we know the first step was not to go for personnel. So 
what are some avenues that you first approach? And one that I looked at was, can we delay the equipment rotation another year? Or And, and I know that all of us probably had many ideas. Um, and that's why I would just like some insight from your end of different places that you looked and just some reasoning why that didn't work out. Sure. So, what, so once again, it's important to remember that um, there's only... We're, when you're looking at areas other than staff, you're only looking at 20% of the budget. And we did look in all areas to determine what we thought was a fiscally responsible reductions that we can take. And as I said to you, we've, we've made some, we've taken some risky moves. So for example, it is risky to assume that um, the, the solar panels will be ho hooked up to PSE&G uh, in time to take all of the reductions necessary. We got to a point in the budget process where, where, if we had to continue to uh, continue to make reductions, there was nowhere else to go, but uh, but the seventy five percent of the budget that is staffing. We did look very closely at the equipment rotation program that we have for uh, in, for instructional technology, and what we had determined was that if we delay the equipment rotation. What we're doing is we're creating a fiscal cliff for us in the following year. Ideally, what you want to do from a budgeting process is you want to create as much of a smooth as possible in terms of having a, a set amount of money for equipment rotation each and every year. We looked at the possibility of delaying the purchase of teacher laptops for one more year. And if we did that and we shifted it to the 25-26 budget, it would create a um, it would create a net increase of five hundred thousand dollars that would have to be found in next year's budget, and that is on top of rising costs in all of the other areas. So ultimately, we deemed that it would not be feasible uh, or wise to do so because in all in all. Um, in all accounts, most likely by all accounts. Most likely, we would uh, next year's equipment rotation money would be insufficient, and to add an incremental five hundred thousand dollars to uh, a line item, knowing that we uh, that it'll be difficult for us to pay for that, uh, we determined that it wasn't fiscally responsible to do so. I have another question. Thank you. Um, is it possible? And I know. Thank you, Allison, for being available on April second at six thirty to answer more uh, parental questions. Um, but is it possible just to give an abridged version of what the historical context was for the ICT classrooms and where they are now and what your vision is, what the outcomes were with the program? Sure, I can give you an, an overview. Uh, so when uh, New York State Education Department uh, added integrated code teaching to their continuum, at that time, we have an or had an integrated co-teaching program where special education teacher was with the general education teacher half the day primarily for ELA and math. And then the other half of the day, they were either in a pullout class, special class working with students with disabilities in ELA and math, or in a second section of integrated co-teaching. While they were in that other class, a teacher assistant was in the classroom. So um, in essence, there were always two adults in the classroom, always a general education teacher. Half the day there was a special education teacher. The other half of the day there was a um, teaching assistant in, in that classroom. Um, then over the years, uh, and actually last year, uh, the teachers asked us to look at a full day model. They would like to work together, two teachers, both general education and special education. So um, we, uh, Dr. Keenstein, uh, met with several teachers and staff, and they explored the possibility of a full day teaching or integrated co-teaching program. And as they met, um, we discussed putting that in place for this year. And looking at the needs of the children and the resources that we have, we have several sections that are full day teaching, um, have two teachers in the classroom, three of which at the elementary have no teaching assistant. 
in the classroom. The other is based on the needs of the students. We have a teaching assistant in the classroom for either ELA and math, or they're, um, they're in there to support the needs of specific children per their IEP. We also have um, several sections, actually two, three, that are the half day model, where there's two adults in the classroom, half the day it's with the special education teacher, the other half of the day they're with the teaching assistant. So we've continued to look at um, the progress of the children, because this year we also looked at the children in the past that would have been in a special class pullout, ELA or math, they're currently being serviced, uh, some of them, by our reading specialists and our math specialists. And we've been looking at their, their progress. So we have found students that are in the full day model, specifically if we look at the three classrooms that have no teaching assistant in, that, in that, those classrooms, but yet two teachers working together throughout the day for all the subjects, where it used to be just ELA and math, we're now in there for ELA, math, science, social studies, writing. They're there just supporting the children. So we've seen, I'm just uh, looking at my notes. So we've seen children um, grow. They've had a nine, one child had a nine level reading progress. They went, uh, it's almost two years growth that we've had in uh, the six months that we've been in school. Um, we've also had students make a four levels of reading progress. We've seen positive results in terms of their own self-esteem because they're not um, being asked to leave the classroom for ELA or math. They're receiving the instruction by both teachers ELA and math, and for some students, they're also getting the added reading and math instruction as a pullout similar to speech, occupational therapy as a related service. Um, and in speaking with the teachers, we met with the teachers again this year, both special education and general education, and asked them, what do they think? Is this a model we should continue next year? And they all of them came back and said, yes, they want to continue the full day uh, ICT working together. They also acknowledge that there will be students based on their specific individual needs that will need the support of a teaching assistant. And so next year, we're looking at full day uh, integrated co-teaching, all the grades in both elementary schools. And there are several students that will need the support of teaching assistance. So just to expand on, on, on a couple of, or underscore just a couple of points there. Um, one of the things that we've been doing with respect to our elementary model in both general education and special education is to make sure that support services are, are truly supplemental and don't supplant uh, to the extent possible that they do not supplant primary instruction. So in other words, if a student requires additional support, that they receive more time, not just a, uh, not just a separate setting, which, all, which usually leads to a different pace of the curriculum. The result of which is, in the previous model, uh, kids do not finish the curriculum at the same rate that kids finish the curriculum in a model where support is supplemental. So one of the big changes to the ICT model with the full day with the full day is that students remain in their classrooms for ELA and math instruction and that those that require additional support receive additional supplemental specialized uh, support from our reading and math teachers. And we've seen tremendous progress and growth in there. Um, it is a best practice model to have the two teachers co-teaching all day. That is a best practice model rather than a teacher leaving halfway through the day and, and being um, uh, and switching with a, uh, with, with a teaching assistant. So in both models, you have two full-time uh, people in the classroom all 
all day long. Of course, this year, since it was a, a pilot year, we have many classrooms that have three adults in the room. We have many classrooms that have three adults in the room this year um, because we were piloting the program. Next year, we will only have three adults in the room based on the needs of particular students. So uh, the default goes back to two adults, which is what it was in 22, 23 and before. And, um, and the additional support provided by a teaching assistant will be provided for those students as required uh, as they qualify uh, on their IEP. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just have one more question. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, my final question is, who will absorb the duties of the teachers that were on special assignment as they arise? Yeah, so that's so, so that's a good question. And we've uh, we've outlined that um, in our slide over here, uh, who those teachers are. So I just want to put it back over here. So right now we have 2.0 IT staff developers budgeted. Uh, we had 2.0 budgeted at the elementary school. Um, we only have uh, one of those positions right now is vacant because we had a resignation right before school started. Uh, and we never filled that, that we never filled that position. So the the one teacher that is currently in the position We'll go back into the classroom in order to help us to reduce class size without having to add an incremental teacher. Her duties in terms of the IP staff developer uh, will have to be reassigned to, uh, to uh, other teachers within the building. We have computer teachers that are in the building that receive lead teacher stipends. Uh, similar to our math specialists, they will be assigned some portion of their day to do professional development and will supplement what they can't do during their day with um, uh, support from the director of technology. And then of course, we, we do have uh, access to Nassau BOCES model schools program, which is professional development for IT staff development that we can use uh, as well. And with respect to the teacher on special assignment for assistive technology, that is a fairly new position. Previously, uh, that work was assigned to contract therapists. Uh, we're going to revert back to that work being assigned to contract therapists. Again, that is necessary in order to have us, uh, in order to reduce the need to hire an additional teacher in such a, in such a tight budget process. So when you revert to Nassau BOCES, you save on the benefits and, um, and the cost because the cost is related just to uh, what you contract them, uh, you know, what you contract them to do in terms of the specific number of hours and kids that are, uh, kids that require it. Thanks for the presentation, Dr. Posse. So I just wanted to summarize a few things and make sure I understand um, some of the things you said. So if we can go back to page nine. So, so on this slide, we're, what, what we're saying is that, that the collective decision-making of the community, of prior administrations, um, the events of the day have brought us to this point. Right, so that the, effectively the, the compounded annual growth rate of our budget has simply been too low. And we can see that manifested when we look at Manhasset's budget versus other similarly situated schools, right, on that slide. So, you know, we, we are at this point and it's, again, like the, the collective, it's the, it's the road we've traveled. And now effectively we have a math problem here. The math problem is our fixed costs for benefits, salary steps, retiree benefits, healthcare are rising faster than the revenues that we can collect. Yes? That's, that's correct. And then that therefore impacts the variable spending that we choose to execute here as a, as a board and as a, as a community and as a district. That's right. Okay. So are we, are we running too lean? Like what, what, what risks do we um, face as a, as a district 
by you know continuing on on this path yeah so uh, i just want to i just want to pull up one of the appendix uh, appendices here one second Okay, so so two things that I two things that I want to point out. One is that uh, if you look at this uh, at, at this slide over here, this shows you um, our fund balance as a percentage. Let's fix that. I don't know if it was me or sorry. So this shows you our fund balance as a percentage, and it shows you where we rank compared to the rest of uh, Nassau County districts. And this was based on the 21-22 data. The 22-23 data just recently became available. And I would suspect that we are um, continue to be right at the right at the bottom over there. Previous in a previous presentation, Dr. Gurgis had uh, presented our fund balance. And he presented our fund balance so that the uh, board had a um, understanding of the different areas that are uh, producing pressure on our budget. And here it's hard to see on the numbers on, uh, on, on, on the screen over there, but on average, our budget after you, so I wanna say a couple of, so we always keep 4%. That is our rainy day in case something happens and it's recommended by the controller and it is necessary for our uh, bond rating. So we always keep 4%. After the 4%, what is left? We then take 700, typically $727,000, and we appropriate it towards our fund balance. Next year, we're recommending that we raise that number slightly. Then after that, we typically are only left with about $1 million. The controller recommends that we should be left with anywhere between 2 and 4%. And our budget is so tight that it does not produce that level of fund balance. And that is a result, that is a result of the fact uh, of the decisions that were made uh, based, on, based on the time, uh, well-reasoned decisions that resulted in a 0% budget followed in close succession to a budget in which we, in which we removed $3.1 million. So the cumulative impact of that over the last 15 years, the district, the district would have had, if those things didn't happen, we would have had uh, incremental funds of 67 million, which would have put us much closer in line, although still below the average of the rest of these districts, it would have still, it would have put us in a, in a much different position. Okay, and then just on the FEMA, windfall, the FEMA reimbursement, what are the types of things that we can earmark those funds for? What restrictions, um, you said can't be recurring expenses, but what are the, some of the things we can use to be creative in that way? Yeah, well, my recommendation is that they're not for reoccurring expenses because they create a cliff for us. So, um, so, so they should be used for one-time expenses. So I am recommending that we use some of the FEMA reimbursement to pay for the change in mascot. That is not budgeted. We are estimating that to cost us $350,000. And again, that is an unfunded mandate from the, uh, from the state. We have no choice but to comply with that. And therefore, I recommend using FEMA money for that. I recommend that we hold $629,000 of the FEMA money in case the budget, uh, the governor's budget does not restore foundation aid to us. Um, in the event that it does not restore foundation aid, it will, the $629,000 will get us through 24, 25, but it will create a cliff for us for 25, 26. So we will have to, the 25, 26 budget will be significantly impacted if the state aid is not restored. But I do, but I do not recommend that we look for another $629,000 of reductions in this budget. And I think that we, I think that we, have faith in our legislatures that they're going to come through for us as they've told us that they that they will. Um, I also recommend that we hold on to some of the FEMA money, at least $200,000 um, in case our, uh, it, it, to address the vulnerability that we are taking when it comes to the solar panels and the EPC. 
In all, uh, the EPC would be safest to take the savings in 25-26. However, we, um, we're not in a position to try to find an incremental $256,000 worth of savings in the budget. The last thing that I would recommend is that we look at the appropriated fund balance. Increasing the appropriated fund balance is another risky move because next year's budget must produce that same amount. And as you saw, the fund balance that we typically produce is, uh, is, 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 is very tight. And since we've removed items from the 20% of the budget that is not staffing, the items that we've removed typically are the items that produce fund balance for us. So I'm worried about what fund balance will look like in 24, 25. So I do recommend that we hold on to FEMA money to, to help us uh, through that. Now, if we receive the $2.1 million incremental, which is, listen, that's a tall order. We don't know if it will come through. Um, but if we do, I recommend some seed money for some of our reserves that we, um, that, that we, that we put it into either a uh, TRS reserve or a, a workers' comp reserve, some reserve that we can pull from in the event that we have a um, that we have a, a budget that looks like this. But of course, I just want to reiterate that using that reserve without the ability to refund it would create another fiscal cliff for us. So we have to be really careful about what we do with that. Um, but I do hope, in terms of fiscal outlook. I do hope that when the Searingtown Road property comes onto the tax rolls, that our growth factor in the property tax is quickly reflected to indicate the 40 or so homes that they are building on that property. When that happens, our tax base growth factor should be adjusted to account for that, and that will allow for some more flexibility within the budget. Do we have any update on that timeline? No, Dr. Gurgis has it, and unfortunately, he's under the weather. Sorry. So when I'm looking at, I'm just going to my paper again. Um, page 30, I guess if we're on. So in my mind, when I'm looking at the positions and how they relate to the budget. It seems to me that there are two categories. Um, there, well, I guess three categories. There are, there's one category, page 29, which those have been redeployed. So that's sort of like a net zero to me right now. On the next page, when I'm looking at these um, teaching assistant positions, they seem to fall into two categories. Correct me if I'm wrong. So one is um, positions related to the ICT model. And the second is positions related to um, budgetary constraints. So the ICT positions, as you discussed earlier, it's a change in, um, in our practice. We, we piloted it. We're happy with the results. We're moving forward with that. So that's happening regardless. Yes. So that's not, those aren't really budget constraints. It's just a change in our curriculum, a change in our strategy. Is that correct? So just the one footnote to that. And yes, that it's a change in program. And so, uh, and so yes. But the one uh, footnote is that the savings that are generated from the reduction in staff, uh, if it were not to occur, because let's say we decided not to change the ICT model, would have to come from other parts of the budget. Because the savings we need in, in order to bridge the gap that we have and in order to produce a balanced budget. But that's really just a lucky coincidence, I guess, so to speak, from a budgeting perspective, that that coincided with this year's budget being so tight. Yes, we, we uh, yes, the change in model allows us to do this. And, um, and yes, so from that perspective. So then that leaves the budget position, the, the, 
the budget reduction positions, which it's one, two, three, four, mi uh, minus five positions, is that right? Five, six, six. And six. So these are not ICT related. These are just general support related in the libraries, the computer labs. So in my mind, I kind of look at them as se a separate bucket. I mean, is that is that a, a, a proper way to, to view this? Yes, that's right. More discretionary, say, than the other ones? That's right. There's uh, the computer lab teaching assistants, the library teaching assistants, the teaching assistant for the departmental, for, for each department. They absolutely provide valuable services to our school, to our students, to our teachers. Um, but they're not required as part of a student's IEP. They're not a special education position. They are a true general education support um, that is discretionary. And, and while it's unfortunate that we have to make these hard decisions, nobody wants to, um, one is programmatic and one is budgetary. That's right. Um, so you talk about fiscal quip. Can you explain in layman's terms what that means exactly? Um, you know, because when we're looking at our numbers, we have, up until this point, we've had, what is it, 725 that we assign from fund balance every year, right? Um, and then I think we're increasing that by the 116. Yeah. So what, when, and, and then you even talked about the notion of possibly considering the equipment rotation, which would have increased that another $500,000. So what does that mean when you say we have a fiscal clip? What does that actually mean next year and in ongoing years in layman's terms? So um, I, I, as I had previously discussed, you know, in a fiscal cliff essentially means that you don't have the, that you may not have the same funds available in the next year. So we are using $840,000 of our appropriated fund balance in order to bridge the gap uh, to create a balanced budget. So let's say we decided that we weren't going to use $840,000 from this year's fund balance. If we determined that we weren't going to use that, then we would need to take another $840,000 worth of reductions out of next year's budget. So the cliff is only created if you're if you are unable to to uh, to generate the same amount of fund balance in 24, 25. So if in next year, we for some reason are unable to create $840,000, then we will need to reduce our expenditures in order to achieve a balanced budget in that year. So it's risky in that, it's risky in that way. And as I've said to you, 20% of the budget is not staffing. We have scoured that 20% of the budget and made all of the reductions that we're comfortable making in order to not create fiscal cliffs in, in, in future years. So if our equipment rotation is typically budgeted at about $800,000, and in the following year, you would need 1.5 million to, uh, to, to fund all the equipment that you want to rotate, there's, there, there's very little likelihood that you'll be able to actually do that. So you'll erode the foundation within the budget, which creates these, uh, which creates these cliffs that you are not able to achieve in future years. So essentially, we would be kicking the can down the road. So next year, just say, we start off the budget process and we say, we calculate based on the tax cap, what out, how much we can raise. So right off the top of the bat, then we have to, sub if we have no additional fund balance remaining, we have to subtract that amount right off the top of what our increase could be under the tax cap. That's right, because ideally each budget stands on its own and ideally you would not need to appropriate $840,000 in order to achieve a balanced budget. What we're doing is we're taking $840,000 from our savings. We're saying that we're going to put it into, we're gonna put it towards next year's expenses and we hope that we generate that same amount of savings in the future year so that so that we don't create a, um, a cliff for us. So, so it's a very, so it's almost like a credit card. It's a very slippery slope. You don't want to get into yes. uh, these habits. Okay. And um, just as an aside, can you just tell me um, how many growth positions we have in the budget right now? Yeah, so we have maintained three elementary growth 
um, but they are growth and leave positions. So anytime a, um, anytime a teacher takes a, a leave of absence and is using their sick days, and we have another teacher that is, a, that is uh, in that position earning a, earning a full salary, in essence, we're paying two, we're paying two teachers for one position. Uh, we have three uh, of those budgeted at the elementary level, and we have two budgeted at the secondary level. Um, that has historically been the right number for us. Um, when you look at, again, we employ a, a large number of people and things happen in terms of personal illness. Uh, and so that has historically been the right number. And sorry to jump around, but just to go back, um, I just had another thought. When, when we're talking about the, um, the assigned fund balance and, and creating the fiscal cliff, as you had mentioned before, um, you know, the notion of just say, looking at reductions in equipment. At, the, at some point, you can reduce that, but at some point in the near future, computers are gonna die and they need to be replaced. So you're never going to avoid that. You're just continuing to kick the can. So ideally, when, if, we're, if we are forced to do reductions, we have to look at expenses that can be permanently eliminated, not delayed. Yes, that's right. And um, I just want to show you, because we have, in, uh, with respect to information technology, you know, the, um, the, the, the increase that we've, that we've budgeted for for next year uh, does reduce our equipment rotation slightly, uh, but it's necessary in order for us to maintain our infrastructure. We have computer-based testing coming uh, as you know, this year, the uh, PSAT exam was all given on computers. Uh, next year, within the next few years, all AP exams will be given on computers. So our information technology infrastructure, it's essential that that works in order to support our academic program. So I do not recommend that we cut anything out of our instructional technology program. We've already presented what we feel is um, what we feel is fiscally responsible, and will allow us to engage in computer-based testing. Which, again, we don't have a choice. We're, we're computer-based testing is coming. Well, and plus, on top of that, technology expenses include more than just what you're looking at: smart boards and computers and laptops. You know, it's it's routers, hubs, ra uh, that's right, nodes, all sort of all sorts of things. That's right, and they're all they're they're outlined here. What we plan to. Uh, you know, the switch upgrades, the server upgrades, those are, those are essential. Um, I just had one more question, but it slipped my mind. You want to go ahead and I'll try to recall? Yeah. Uh, just uh, a couple questions I got for you. Looking at this and um, you know, we're talking about the co-teaching model, TAs, and we're talking about the elimination jobs. And, you know, these are real people. These are real faces that were, and these are, I know these aren't easy decisions and it weighs heavy on everyone when we look at this. Um, just for this ICT co-teaching model that we're talking about, I'm just trying to get a better idea of that. Is there other districts that are out there that are also utilizing this? I know we've only started piling it for the year, but what are the other districts out there doing? Have we reached out to them? And what is their, what is their model? Look like? Yeah, so I have reached out to our whole quadrant. I've reached out to uh, the superintendents and all of the surrounding districts here. Um, some districts still have the half-day model, and they do that primarily because it's more cost-effective. You, um, you are able to employ less special education teachers in that model because the um, because their day is split with a teaching assistant. But nobody who does that thinks that it is a best practice model. They're doing that because it's cost effective. The best practice model is two teachers in the classroom for the entire day. Um, the other districts that do have the two teachers in the classroom the entire day, by default, that is the model. If there are children that require a teaching assistant, then a teaching assistant is provided. But the default is not three adults, it's two adults. And that's the model that we're recommending that we continue with. But every child that requires a TA on an IEP gets a, you know, had, gets a TA? Yes, and again, we don't have a choice regarding IEP mandates. What the Committee of Special Education de determines, we have to fund. 
So, um, so we have done, uh, we've done our best projections, but as you know, as same as the case with out of district placements, that sometimes things change and we require more or less based on what, um, based on what actually happens at the CSC meetings, but there are actual qualifications that the CSC needs to consider in order to, in, in order to, uh, determine if a, child requires additional support because again it provides a more restrictive program and uh, more restrictive uh, Allison can speak about that uh, we strive to be least restrictive absolutely we follow the New York State guidelines when it comes to looking at a student's need for a teaching assistant or an aide a supervisory aide so there's specific criteria that uh, the state requires that we look at um, and if we do assign a teaching assistant or an aide, we must come up with a fading plan. How do we fade uh, that teaching assistant or aide from that child? So you're building that child's, um, their own independence, their skills. And, and what we're seeing uh, with this year's pilot is our students are, are doing well. Uh, we continue to monitor that and we're meeting their needs. And thank you. Um, and then looking at the class sizes, remember your question. Yep. Um, don't forget. Uh, and looking at the class sizes, and they, I mean, the numbers are pretty remarkable. And I know you looked at if we were looking at last year's model, how we'd be doing it, and we'd have certain classes or grades that we would be keeping an eye on to August. Um, can you just what led us down this path to? take such a significant difference in class size, because as you said, there's a couple grades there that we would have taken out a section and gone back to last year's model, but what took us down this guide? Sure. So, um, so, so two things primarily. Uh, for the last several years, we have surveyed our uh, staff. We've asked them, uh, what are things that we should focus on? What are priorities that we should have? And uh, in all cases, uh, one of the, in all years, I should say, one of the primary uh, things that are repeated by staff is that we should we should seek to lower class size. And we've heard that from teachers at the elementary level, as well as teachers at the secondary level. In addition, we heard from our community over the last two years that uh, there, there was a sentiment that classes of 25 and 26 at the elementary level were too high and they should be set lower than at least two lower than 25, 26. So we strove to, to do that in this budget. Um, there was a lot of talk last year about the class size guidelines and parents were demanding to know where the guidelines came from, how long they've been in existence. And we said the class size guidelines have been in existence for a long time. Nobody really knows their origin. So we determined to have a committee come together to reaffirm whether or not these class size guidelines make sense. The committee has reaffirmed that the class size guidelines are reasonable, but they say with a caveat that we should strive to be below guidelines whenever possible. So we set the budget with that, um, with that priority in mind. So right here in grades five and six at Muncie Park, in a year other than, um, in a year where we weren't looking to reduce class size or change our guidelines, we would have had uh, one less section of grade five, one less section of grade six. At Shelter Rock, grade five would have been a grade that we would have watched because as you see, we have 100 kids currently in grade four. So we have 100 kids in that cohort that are moving to grade five. We project another three to come, but they haven't come yet. So we would have set the class size here to be at 25. And then we would have waited until August. We would have seen if the three kids actually came. Um, and then we would have made a decision. Are we comfortable with leaving it at 25 or do we use one of our growth positions and make it um, and, and make the class size uh, add an additional section? Then what we would have done is we would have gone back to Muncie Park and we would have said, do we have parity between the two buildings? And we would have had a discussion about, we would have had a discussion about that. So, um, so in this budget, we added three teachers to the elementary level in order to comply with what we've heard from our teachers over the last several years and also from the community, 
with respect to class with respect to class size at the secondary school, which we don't talk about a lot, but at the secondary school this year in particular, um, we had an influx of students late in uh, in August that were enrolled, and uh, and many of our secondary school classes were were very large. So we strove to make sure that um, in a typical year, we usually used a class size guidelines at the secondary school of 28. Uh, this year, when crafting class size guidelines, we served to be two below. We looked at 26. So with that in mind, we've added um, we've added teachers to the secondary school as well. Yeah. Right, go ahead. All right. Um, Everything we've gone over here, I'm just curious, is there any priorities that's been identified? I know there's certain things that every department came here and they asked for different aspects for their department going into this upcoming year. Is there anything from administration uh, of our different buildings that they asked for that we weren't able to cover in this? Is there things that, you know, what were some of the first things that cut in regards to those items? Mm -hmm. So one of the themes that we've heard from our administrators and um, and our staff over the last several years is that uh, many of our offices are, um, are are short staffed. So we had sought to add uh, clerical support in uh, the business office with an uh, I'm sorry an accountant in the business office. We sought to add clerical support to the human resources office. We were unable to accomplish that in this budget. At the secondary school, the principal had requested an additional clerical. Um, we were not able to accomplish that. Also, right now, um, the uh, right now the, the the principal has a clerical assistant. One uh, assistant principal has a half time clerical assistant, and the other has an unfilled position. He was asking us to to make sure we had enough clerical support for the whole for the whole building. We were not able to accomplish that. The other request that's actually now um, uh, transpired from both the previous principal and this principal is the addition of a dean of students. And um, the dean of students would take care of essentially low level discipline throughout the building, including attendance and, and other matters. Um, we were unable to fund that. Uh, as a reminder, one of the reasons that uh, our uh, previous assistant principals had given us at their exit interviews for why they decided to leave was because uh, they thought that the job was uh, was 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 really too large, and they felt that uh, we were understaffed. When you compare our level of staffing to other secondary schools of a comparable size, we they really should have uh, an additional person there. But unfortunately, we were not able to accomplish that in this budget. This dean of students you're talking about, uh, who's is that the assistant principals that are bearing that right now on top of their other duties? Yeah. Yes, along with the principal. All right, well, we just spent the last hour, at least, talking about how we've been pinching our pennies and managing to the best of our ability over the last number of years. Um, and yet, despite all of our best efforts, we are constantly being surprised with unfunded mandates from the state. So I, I just, off the, as I was sitting here taking notes during the presentation, I just came up with uh, a, you know, a couple off the top of my head that we've had to deal with this year. Um, we, you know, so some of them are, are, are you know, very noble and just, and yet some of them are just very onerous. Uh, one example is paying for the, the changing of the mascot. We have to pay for that. and. We've been giving no dispensation from the state. In fact, they've taken away our foundation aid. Um, we now have to um, support special ed students through their 22nd birthday, which is a, a, a change, which is yeah, through their 21st year. Okay. Until they turn 22, June of the year they turn 22. Which was unexpected. It came after the budget was already set for this current year. And yet it's an expense that we've had to deal with an unbudgeted, unfunded expense. And we're not allowed to ask for excess cost state aid. What does that mean? The other piece. Does that mean that if the overall uh, cost in educating um, a student 
is more than 65,000, we can typically ask for state aid back a percentage. We're not able to. So it's truly an unfunded mandate. So, so as the year goes on, more and more of these unfunded mandates from the state come in, and we have no choice but to honor them and to, and to pay for them. Another one is we have now have the early mail-in voting, which I'm assuming we have to fund. The state's not giving us money for that, right? Yeah. Uh, among other things, such as like overseeing the private schools now in our district, right? Which that's new that came this year as well. So I'm sure the, the list. I'm sure the list could go on and on if I gave you some time. Uh, but that's just to give everybody an example of some of the pressures that we deal with that are completely unanticipated and unexpected. Any further questions? Right. Okay, so uh, at this time, it is open to the public for comments and questions uh, only in regards to the presentation, we ask if you come up, you state your name, uh, affiliation, uh, where you're from, and we limit, uh, ask you to limit your, to either one question or a comment of three minutes or less, so. Hello, I'm Stephanie Yakovone. I am the MESPA president in Manhasset, which is all of the support system of everything in Manhasset. So I was looking through the website and I saw something that is published from the board and I'd like to read it to you, everybody to understand and then go from there. It's about your mission. We recognize each child as an individual with potential to achieve their personal best. We are committed to guiding our students with their unique educational journeys by nurturing their abilities and encouraging their growth mindset while challenging and supporting their academic development and fostering their social and emotional well-being. I'd like to first address the mission of supporting academic uh, development. Currently in the co-teach classrooms, students with a TA present, um, represent help, I'm sorry, let me start that over. Currently in the co-teach classrooms, uh, students with a TA present help to support the teachers with reteaching lessons, extra support, data collection. Keep in mind, there's quite a few IEPs in those classrooms. Constant reinforcing to keep on task and to finish a lesson. TAs often help to de-escalate students when they are in crisis. We also provide move and breaks out of the room as well. And this is just to name a few of our duties. Please remember if it is a one-on-one -on -one or a two-on-one -on -one in that classroom, that TA, they are only for those students. They are not for the classroom. It is not a classroom TA. That TA is only for those people or those students. The extra support in the classroom is why these co-teach classes are successful. My understanding is that this is data-based. If that is the case, why would you remove the support that is making these rooms so successful? Teaching assistants are vital in supporting our teachers and most importantly, providing individual attention to our students. Dr. Posse's uh, proposed budget has 14 positions being accessed due for budget reasons. We believe that this is a disservice to the students who need the help, whether it's in the classroom, computer lab or library. I urge the school board to reconsider these proposed budget cuts and explore alternative solutions that prioritize the educational needs of our students. Our children deserve the best possible learning environment and maintain adequate support. Staff is essential to achieving this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dr. Posse, Mrs. Rushforth, and everybody on the board. My name is Darlene DePietro. I'm standing before you today as an enhanced community member and a parent of children with both special needs, both visible and invisible. Manhasset and the Shelter Rock educational community has always been a guiding light and supporter for my family. I may cry, so I'm sorry. Um, um, but especially for um, in the early years, um, as we were navigating the social, the emotional, and educational paths of our little ones, especially that with which my daughter Bella has been on. 
The amount of support, care, and love she has received from her teachers, the staff, and the students at Manhasset is nothing short of... Wait, hold on, I just wrote everything down. Arlene, <laughs> Deep Pietro. Just wrote, when you when you speak, we can't speak directly about a specific student. Oh, thought you okay, sorry. You just got to start talking broader strokes. Okay, I'll start from broader strokes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, it's about the support that we received from the Manhasset community and the teachers. Um, this is not the norm across the state. I know this because my sister and a lot of my family members are teachers in different districts, special ed and in general ed. So I know Manhasset is a very special community in that aspect. And I have appreciated everything that I've gotten with the support being here. Um, but I, I really want to really let you know that with that being said, the teachers at Shelter Rock have been exemplary in, in, in our educational experience in both the gen ed and special ed communities. Their commitment to education in our children is evident in the children's academic process, um, progress and the smiles on our children's faces when we ask, how did school go today? This community is exactly that. It's a community which we all support one another. Teachers cannot give their best if they are not supported. Our children cannot be their best if they are also not supported. The responsibilities of the TA consists of so much in both the support of the teachers and the students. Having a TA in the classroom is like having another teacher um, who can support all, all learners, not just the gen ed, but the special ed students as well. I know that they don't have to, but if they're, if they're just a one-on-one, -on -one, but they do. Their presence allows our gen ed teachers greater flexibility to reach and differentiate their curriculum um, for the gen ed and both the special education teachers. They assist in delivering the excellent education the students of Shelter Rock and throughout Manhasset are used to. I ask the board to please reconsider their budget proposal with regards to our special education population. All of our children deserve the best opportunities to, to succeed and grow. And I know that reducing our teachers' assistance will not provide that. I do thank you for all of your continued support and care given to all of our children. And there is no truly better place than Manhasset. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Casey Markowski. I have lived in Manhasset for over 10 years, and I currently have two children at Shelter Rock. I'm an active member of our SCA, and I've served as room rep and been involved in countless school activities. In my capacity as an actively involved parent, I have been fortunate to spend significant time within the walls of our school. I am proud to say that Shelter Rock Elementary is full of some of the most dedicated, passionate, and hardworking teachers and staff around. I constantly share with friends and family like Darlene how lucky I feel to have children at Shelter Rock and how grateful I am for the care and education they receive every day. It has come to my attention uh, after the, our most recent board meeting that some of these dedicated, passionate, and hardworking individuals will now be losing their, their positions due to budget cuts and restructuring. As a parent, this has me very concerned. I fear that many parents in our community may have an outdated concept of the role of a teaching assistant in the classroom, and I'm sure that many people may imagine it to be an extra person who helps make copies. I myself would have thought the same thing were it not for the time that I've spent in our school and seeing firsthand how much these people do to facilitate the day-to-day -day needs of our students. It is clear to me that the TAs are a vital and integral part of the day of many students, especially those in an ICT setting. For some students, the presence of a TA and or multiple TAs has been essential to their success in the classroom. Our teachers rely on the presence of these TAs and they are imperative to providing support to the very students who need our support the most. When we see a student beginning to thrive in the classroom, it should not be an indication to reduce aid, but rather a confirmation that the additional support is doing what it was meant to do. Losing this necessary support will have a negative impact not only on our students with support needs, but also our general education student population. When a problem arises in the classroom that pulls focus and requires a teacher's attention, it's the TAs who step up to help out. Whether removing a child who needs to be de-escalated, talking to a child, taking a child to a required movement break, offering a sensory diet, or just the comfort of a person who has worked with the student for years and knows their needs well, our teachers and our TAs work together to meet that need. And unfortunately, our students don't line up and take turns to decide when each of them is going to require extra assistance. Many times there may be multiple students at once who require extra resources. 
Other times, one child may demand the attention of multiple adults in the room. It seems clear to me that this stands to put a huge strain on our teachers in the classroom as a whole, and this is where our TAs come in. They are uniquely qualified to assist in instruction in a way that supervisory aides are not, and as they cannot fill the same shoes as they are not able to help with instruction, homework, take a child on the side to reinforce a lesson, or a litany of other tasks that require teaching certification. Without the TAs, I fear our teachers will be in a position where they need to put out the biggest fire first. That will most likely come at the expense of our general education students. Our TAs are actively involved in the day-to-day -day logistics that help the whole classroom to function as efficiently as possible. As a district, I believe it's important we show support for our teachers if we wish to attract and retain top-tier employees. And as a parent, I believe it's imperative that we set our teachers up for success if we wish our children to be successful as students. I fear the loss of this significant number of TAs will put an undue strain on our teachers who are tasked with the more strenuous job of a large class population with increased emotional, behavioral, and educational needs. And I fear the loss of these TAs will make it more difficult for our teachers to meet the requirements of the support the students need. And let me be very clear that my opinion, our teachers would benefit from more help is in no way indicative of a lack of performance ability or training on the part of our wonderful teachers. It is merely a common sense observation that more hands and eyes in a classroom full of students that have additional support needs makes sense. Um, I understand we're dealing with cuts to funding, and I have written letters on your suggestion based on what Dr. Posse and the board have sent to Governor Hochul. I've echoed those concerns, um, as well as to local leadership, and um, considering, you know, what we have to work with a budget, it is frustrating to feel as a parent that in Manhasset we are somehow just scraping by to provide the necessary, necessary support for our children. Um, and I also know Again, from tonight, we have pointed out these cuts aren't necessarily due to budget constraints, um, but were in place due to the restructuring of the ICT model. Um, as Dr. Posse said in the last meeting and, and again tonight, we are moving forward with the full-time teaching model because the research has shown that this is the best practice model. And I agree, I thank you. Having a co-teacher only there for half a day as in the past was misleading. When a parent is told their child will be in a classroom with two teachers, it is reasonable for that parent to assume that they will in fact have two teachers. I'll try to talk very fast. We're, I, we're, uh, we're uh, just hitting a little over our limits. So if you're right. wrap it um, up, I'll just include and I'll talk about uh, ICT next week with um, Dr. Rushworth. But um, just in closing, our teaching assistants are active educators who are essential to the daily success of our students. It's my hope that we can discover a more palatable alternative. Our students who are most in need of our help are being directly and negatively impacted by this. And I hope we can find another less detrimental solution. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I didn't think anything. Relatively <laughs> quick. Um, my name is Antonio Martins. We're new to the community. We moved here in August from uh, Brooklyn. <clears throat> and for the first three years of my son's school career, we paid for him to go to private schools. And some of these were, the last one was a twice exceptional school in Manhattan. We spent a considerable amount of money <clears throat> to have him enrolled there because of the challenges uh, for someone with his abilities and some of the challenges of disabilities. Don't want to use that, but there, there are certain challenges that he deals with and we deal with as a result of it. When we started looking at alternatives specifically on Long Island, we went and met with uh, several school districts. We chose Manhasset specifically because of the programs that were offered. And we've benefited from it. Our son has thrived here, specifically in, in, the, in the, that co-teaching model. A lot of the information that we use for the IEP is, is gathered and tabulated by the TAs. I don't think that people understand that during unstructured times, when the students are moving to recess, gym, lunch, in the hallways, 
no one's watching as closely as in the, in each individual classroom. And it's during those times that the TAs are taking notes and gathering information. So when there is something that causes dysregulation, that they're able to identify the precedents, right, the antecedents, and they're able to actually develop strategies to cope with it. So when you have certain things that happen during that year, you can take measures to make sure they don't repeat themselves, right? There's there's things that you could do to better that situation. All that is done through the TAs. Without them being there, I, I feel that it would be difficult to replace that information. Um, and I would encourage that the board and the district reconsider the way that they're cutting and, and, and fitting their budget. I, I did have a question as well, if I have a, a minute. Do I have a quick question? Go ahead. What's your quick question? Co-teaching, right? It, it occurs to me that if you have half-time teachers, they're there half-time now? No, it's one full-time, one half-time. The new model is full-time. If I understood correctly, the old model included a, a full-time and a half-time, no? The old model. We're still partially in that old model. Yes? So, it's, what's, so what's the question? What's the question? The question is, it, it, wouldn't you have to actually hire more teachers in order to make sure you have those two teachers in the classroom? Or did I miss that? Right, right now, if you have a teacher only there half-time and they're moving into another class, if you're adding two full-time teachers, wouldn't you need to add more teachers? No, because what we've done is, uh, as um, when what Ms. Rushworth has explained, we also changed the pullout and um, the pullout model. So in the previous model, what happened was you had a ICT teacher assigned to the grade. For half the time, the ICT teacher was in integrated co-teaching. And for the other half of the time, they provided pullout instruction for students who um, for, for students for ELA and math. And as I said, the problem with that is that those students are receiving a different paced curriculum and they're not actually receiving additional time. They're receiving a different curriculum at a different pace. And so the preferred model is that the students who require uh, that kind of specialized instruction get it supplementally instead of for it to supplant. It's the same change that we've made in with respect to our general education AIS model. And it, uh, it is supported by research and it makes all the sense in the world. So that is, the, that, that is why the teacher is available now for full day ICT. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Posse and the board. I just came to address as a student um, of the school that I've had special don't, education. Don't forget to. I was don't forget your name. name. Just to re oh, so Luke everyone. Altenera. I'm sorry. I'm a student. We, we know who you are, but just uh, you know, <laughs> for, for those watching at home. I've had special education services since I was in kindergarten, and I've had TAs, I've had OT, I've had PT, I've had everything. Um, to see that these budget cuts are going to cut 14 TAs who are my friends who I see in the hallway, who I say, hey, how are you? You know, it's unfair, you know, and I asked the board tonight if we can reconsider and we can find other ways to cut, to cut budgets, software budgets, anything, because at the end of the day, these are people, these are people, they're going to lose their, their jobs, they're going to lose, you know, their apartments, they're going to lose their lives if they lose their job. No, it's very hard. A lot of it, these aren't easy decisions, and um, you know the, the proposed budgets out there. And obviously, there's a, a lot of um, 
obstacles that are there in front of us, but we absolutely, that is not rest lightly on us as to we're talking about real people, people who mean a lot to the school, the community who have had a huge impact on you and other students that are in there. So uh, it's not easy decisions that are being made right now that we're being put into. But uh, I think the experience that you had is, uh, is or have or having is, um, you know, speaks volumes uh, for the people who are in this room. So thank you. Thank you. I think it's you now. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Rob Mashburn, uh, secondary school computer teacher, and for the next uh, three months, staff developer. I didn't want to interrupt anyone's discussion about the uh, teaching assistant situation. I realize how important that is. I've been here 17 years. Seven years I've been a teacher, and before that, I was a TA. I know how important that is. I actually have two important topics to talk about, and I'm going to be a, a little selfish and discuss the technology side of this for a second. Um, the only issue that really relates to our budget discussion is this. The plan to completely remove any staff development from our school is a mistake. We've had staff developer in our district. I've looked back at the records since the year 2000. This is not a recent development. In, I was hired 2017. We decided we needed a second one for our elementary schools, 2018. We decided each of our schools needed another one in 2019. So we had three going into COVID. The idea of cutting staff development because COVID is done and we don't need them anymore is not a smart decision for our schools. I could read to you, and I created a list here before I knew about our three-minute limit, about the things that I do on a daily basis, the programs that we have created to make the lives of our administrators, our teachers better. We talked about this no mascot vote. You know who made the poll with Principal Roeder? The teaching staff at our school uses technology, yes, but things like the testing center in secondary school that was built by our staff developers, training on how to use these things as staff developers. Every district has a different requirement. This district uses our staff developers to make sure every employee correctly uses technology. Dr. Posse, as you said, this year, computer-based testing is starting. Next year, it's going to get even worse. My responsibility during NWEA week, when we have to do nothing but computer-based testing, I get a sub for the classes that I teach, and I make sure those things work. We have at the elementary school just one staff developer right now who is being overwhelmed as it was and is going to have more responsibilities back in the room, fine, but they're not going to be able to help the people they want to help. Neither will I personally. And I think that some of our staff agrees this should be a full-time 1.0 job, which we've never had. There's a lot of things I could talk about here, but really when it comes down to this, uh, we have a great IT staff. Thank you for recording our videos and for broadcasting it on YouTube. They're wonderful. They're great, but they're behind the scenes people. They are not teachers. A staff developer is a teacher. We train other people on how to use technology. We investigate solutions. We anticipate problems that others don't anticipate, and we have the means to help those people. If there's an emergency, a teacher, a TA, anybody knows, they can contact their staff developer, and they will be in that classroom for 40 minutes to help them out. To lose that, even if it was just one person for the district for an emergency to go around different places to help out, that is a real shame. As I said, there's nothing wrong with cutting things that need to be cut. I don't envy you, but this sort of situation, it is going to hurt our students. It's going to hurt our school. It is going to make next year truly, truly difficult to endure for a lot of our teachers. We have the most technology use ever, including brand new New York State standards for computer science and digital fluency, and we have no staff developer to help our teachers fulfill those standards it's going to be very difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mashburn. Hi, um, my name is Karen Backer. I'm a parent here in the district and I am also a teacher here in New York. Um, 
I have seen, I have a son who's in high school and I have a daughter who's at Shelter Rock Elementary School. And um, I have seen firsthand how helpful teacher assistants have been to my son over the years. Um, he's doing very nicely in school and um, I really appreciate everything they've done. And over the years, I have seen teacher assistants support both behavioral and education here in the Manhasset District. If you eliminate these positions, who will you use to fill in the gaps that will occur with the students and curriculum in the district? Typically, elimination of these positions will affect students who need them the most. And I would just really, um, I ask that you reconsider your decision to cut these positions. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more comment on this. Quickly, I have no prepared remarks, but I'm inspired by many of the others who've spoken tonight. Um, my name is Melissa Rossidi Knapp, and I'm a parent um, of a graduate of Manhasset High School and a current student in Manhasset Middle School. Um, my daughter, through IEP mandated, um, having an IEP mandated um, a TA, has benefited tremendously from her days in kindergarten where she would wander out of the classroom and could have been a liability for the school had she disappeared because the teachers didn't notice, all the way through today where she's advocated herself without my prompting to eliminate her TAs one by one. And that has been tremendous for her, for her own self-advocacy, um, and also um, obviously for, for the school not having to those responsibilities. However, I will say that I do worry that when she eventually has no TAs, um, through her IEP program that I worry about when she is not able to self-regulate, when she does choose to leave the classroom, if that were to happen, what who's gonna be there to do it? Because I know that the general ed teachers will not be able to um, adequately look after her. And I do very much worry about when that happens. So I do also urge the board um, to please reconsider and um, give this a lot more thought. And I know you already have, and I thank you for that. Again, um, this is not an easy decision. These are not, we've got some big obstacles, as we said earlier. Uh, Dr. Posse has worked to try to find alternatives. We will continue to look at it. Um, like I said, it's not a TA on a piece of paper. It's people, it's positions. It's part of the Manhasset family. And uh, when that affects any part of the Manhasset family, we try to look as deeply as possible. So um, I can't sit here and tell you there's promises that we'll be able to fix it. We're gonna do everything we can looking through it. Um, again, please continue to write the state. We're gonna to continue to work and push there. Um, there's a lot of limitations that keep coming at all the school districts uh, up and down Long Island. We're not alone in this uh, on Long Island, unfortunately, uh, as you look through the paper and see what some of these other school districts are doing. So we're gonna do our best um, with the kids in mind and with the Manhattan family in line. Um, but at this point, we're gonna move on to on the agenda to the, uh, the next item. Uh, you guys are more than welcome to stay. Uh, we're gonna talk about some policy. And, uh, but I do realize that uh, you a lot of you have to get to work in the morning. So if you'd like to leave, I, I understand 100%. Thank you so much for your time and all you do.
All right, you guys ready? So we're going to move along to the policy review. So I'll pass it over to you to take us through. Okay, we have two policies on the agenda for this meeting. One of them is the second reading of policy um, 1050, which is the annual budget and vote and school board elections. Um, and as we've noted at this meeting, we are now legally required to allow early mail-in votes. Um, last week, we did discuss just, there's one sentence that's going to be changed on this policy um, for this review. I had it written with the specific mail-in, early mail-in votes, um, but we discussed the potential to change it to be more general, which was legal gave us the okay to do. So the only change on this is item seven, absentee and other ballot. Uh, it says early mail-in ba ballots. I apologize, I should say other ballots. Yeah. I, will adjust, I will adjust that for the third reading. Um, absentee ballots and absentee ballot application forms, as well as other ballots and ballot application forms as required by state law, will be made available for all district elections in accordance with the educational law. And that is the only change on that whole policy, is that one sentence. Any questions on that? To change, uh, change, change the title, sorry, I apologize, I will do that. I didn't catch that. So we're well, okay putting that forward to a third and final reading? And then we have policy 4321.12, which is on for third reading and a vote. Um, that was substantially changed the first time around um, based on new regulations. Um, I had questioned my own adjustments of this, um, which I just wanted to go back and review um, regarding the use of timeout rooms. Our policy still does say that a behavioral intervention plan as dictated through a child's IEP will identify factors um, and basically all the rules we would follow. When utilizing a timeout room, because this policy is now being changed to be about special education students and all students, um, I just wanted to go back and clarify, as I said the last meeting, that we didn't have to put in the section about timeout rooms, um, include what we would do with regular education students. The feedback that I received um, from the legal team is that because that is a very rare occurrence that would only happen in an emergency situation, which is dictated by state law. We really do not need to put that in our policy because the law would supersede um, our policy anyway. And that is really just in an emergency situation. So they suggested we leave it as we had the last two readings. Um, so there's been no changes to that policy. And this one was up for a third reading. So if we're comfortable tonight, we'll vote and approve this. Anyone's comfortable with that? All right. All in favor of adopting fourth policy 4321.12. All right. And we'll go ahead and we'll move policy 1050 to a third and final reading for the next meeting. And that takes us to our committee reports, audit committee. Any updates? Uh, we met on Tuesday and we received the uh, risk assessment from the internal auditors, as well as the review of the human resources and contractually paid employees um, special area. And then the next meeting will be, I think about in a month or so, with the uh, external auditors. And then the finance meet also? That's um, uh, next week on the 26th. Right. Uh, Mac, we met Monday. Oh. And um, as you guys saw on the agenda, we had the Mac Middle School Athletic Policy. Mac has been working on athletic policy for middle school to kind of help manage expectations of students, guide coaches. Oh. Um, so it's a, it is not a policy for us to vote on. It's kind of like the, uh, the parent communication protocol that we came up about four years, but it's just so the board can see the document and we are aware of the document that'll be handed out to students and parents of middle school athletes talking about the goals of middle school sports, uh, playing time in middle school sports and help coaches as well as parents and athletes manage uh, all those different um, aspects. Of it. So at the end, you'll be able to uh, and then we also talked about the athletic hallway that continues to be in an ongoing progress. And we actually had the track, the women's track coach 
uh, came and talked to us uh, just about the, some of the different challenges they have with the, the numbers between the men's and women's track and the success that they're having as well. Uh, SCA. Uh, tower, the, as we know, the Tower Dance was raised money for the uh, DIT, the touch screens and everything else. Uh, when you bring it into the hallway, we have to look at uh, fair and prevailing wages. So a project that might have started, we were looking at in 130000 now goes up to half a million dollars. Um, before all the other financial issues that we were working with, there was a definitive path that we were working towards uh, as other things have come up. It's touch and go. So the design is there. Uh, what we want to do in the hallway has been worked out with the architect as well as with a cabinet maker. Uh, the technology and all of that has been purchased, but uh, we're kind of on a crunch on timeline because if it was to happen this summer, there is a deadline that we things have to start moving where plaques have to come off wall and the redesign of everything. So. Uh, in a perfect world, it'd be great if we can find a way to make it happen this summer. But um, as you know, we're, we're dealing with other constraints that may limit that. So I think we've found funding for the, someone donated funding for the actual, um, the cases, thank you, the actual cases. So it's really the installation, construction, deconstruction of the hallway. And again, that is the heaviest price that, that's coming in that. Um, SCA. Um, the SCA fair is Saturday, May 4th. The deadline for the journal ads is March 28th. Please consider supporting the SCA by sponsoring a ride, game, or booth, or by buying a journal ad. Uh, many volunteers are still needed, so please consider donating your time for this great event. And uh, the SCA membership drive is still open. Membership is only $40. Please consider supporting the SCA. Is it the SCA? I'm working the hot dog booth. Nadia's got the bakery. Come visit us. All right, next we got Pace, our tower. I'm sorry. Tower just completed uh, their very successful dinner dance. Um, it was great. So we thank them for. Wonderful night, and um, I believe it was a great success. Peace. Peace recently had a meeting, how to prepare for your CSC meeting on March 19th, and that is our update for Peace. Casa? Casa unfortunately had to cancel their sector meeting uh, today, and uh, there was also um, an event that was um, continued, uh, posted with the SEA. Uh, it's called Stop and Send. And it is on March 26, Tuesday, March 26, 7 p.m. for fifth and sixth grade families. And it is a compliment to an assembly recently held for fifth and sixth grade students by the Nassau County DA, Teresa Tibet. And it's a free parent session via Zoom that will educate parents on warning signs, risks, and tools needed to ensure children's safety and responsible digital use. Uh, the Zoom link was sent, will be sent out via email in the coming days. And it was also um, sent out via the SEA highlights. Uh, technology hasn't met. Uh, in regards to EOC, uh, we recently met last week. The, as they talked, as Allison and Graf talked about, uh, the fair was, uh, the job fair was a success. Uh, they're very happy with everything that was there and look, talking about different ways to build on it next year. Um, also, uh, Christine Raffo going over and helping with family ID was a big success. And um, Rebecca and Lauren went over with, I think Rich helped them in regards to Canvas and getting on Parent Portal those outreaches, uh, what we're trying to discuss right now is ways to kind of make it a one or two night where we can capture more families at the EOC. So there was only three, two or three families, which was very beneficial for, but how can we create and piggyback on maybe some of their other camps and events to have more families involved in that? 
Uh, we also talked about the voting for the mascot to make sure that um, everyone in the community is aware. So it's again, a full community faculty uh, vote for that. Um, anything else? No, okay. Uh, team name committee. Uh, the quick update on that is uh, email went out to the subcommittee. Uh, they're putting together, bless you. Uh, they're putting together the recommendations for the ballot that's going out. Uh, the uh, right now we're trying to finalize if we're going to put three names or four names, and that's up to that committee to decide because I was going back and forth. Um, and then that will be going out to the community, hopefully. Uh, by the early to mid April. And then based on those results, uh, we may have a, a fourth round, which would be decided from the seventh and 12th graders, but uh, that will be, they'll have a week of voting in the community and the faculty, and that'll be put out. You have to be grades seven through 12. Um, you also have to have a address of Manhasset uh, in those regards. So that'll hopefully be going. And, and faculty and staff, but I said, yes, no, that's part of the decision process. Um, anything else going to add to that? Or, no? Okay. Moving on to personnel. Everyone had a chance to look at the personnel schedule. All in favor? Yeah, I just had one. Sorry, one shoot. So, so it just looks like, Dr. Prosky, we're replacing. We have several doing like 0.2 FTE to replace one teacher's lead. Is that right? So like a kind of a, a group, a team effort here. Yeah, so uh, that's a hard to fill position. And we were not able to secure a certified substitute um, for the position. So therefore, we are uh, having teachers take on an additional assignment as an overage. So the 0.2 reflects an additional class assignment. All right, so all in favor of the personnel schedule? All right. Uh, we also have a resolution here to uh, grant tenure for Samantha Meyer and music. All in favor? All right. Uh, if you take a look at the consent agenda, CSC, that's through there. Uh, conference request again, uh, Unitarian uh, Church Agreement, the financial reports, warrant and wire reports that we have. Uh, on there. Motion to approve the consent agenda. All right. All in favor. So at this time, we are at public comment. Uh, again, we ask when you come out that you limit it to one question or three minutes. Uh, please do not use any names of students, personnel, um, and keep it respectful to the board and those in the room. Uh, at this time, whoever would like to come up, you can come on up at 30 seconds to go towards three minutes. I'll kind of give you a, a light wave just to give you a little signal there. So. It's me again. Hi, uh, Rob Mashburn. Once again, uh, this time, not in my role as a staff developer. Um, still believe that's a mistake. I think that role is not going to be able to be filled by these people who are getting small stipend. But here I am in my role as a computer teacher. Uh, this is not directly something that was discussed within the budget, but something that I have heard that is being planned for next year, which is the uh, cutting in half of the planned number of sections of seventh grade computer classes. We currently don't have any eighth grade computer classes at all, which is a shame and something we've long hoped to resolve. But now we're cutting our seventh grade classes in half. If this is indeed the case, I hope it's not. I hope this was a mistake from what I've heard, but I don't believe it was. Uh, I don't know what this is meant to accomplish. If the goal is to have less sections to reduce the budget even further, the reason that we have so many sections of seventh grade computer literacy is to create a flexible schedule for the seventh graders. The plan to reduce it down to two periods a day, you usually have 10 sections every other day, so five periods a day, total of 10 sections means that there's more time for seventh graders to have computer class. By reducing it down to two periods a day, that means by necessity, a big portion of our seventh graders are not gonna be able to have that class. But the last day I was in front of a board like this, I was receiving recognition for winning our hackathon a few years ago. And now I'm here defending that we are gutting our program. 
the plan, from what I understand it, has no other electives for seventh graders in mind. It is a every other day schedule. So the only alternative that I see being raised in the scheduling portion is for seventh graders to have a study hall. And I don't know if this has been considered by the administration. I'm not sure if this is something the board directly needs to hear, but I thought this was the best avenue to bring it up to the general powers that be in regard to this topic. Uh, seventh graders, eighth graders, middle school is my passion. Computers are what I excel at, it's where I wanna be. This year I've taken an emergency teaching of our AP high school classes because of the situation that required it to happen. But my goal is really to either be full-time PD, which I love, to teach middle school computers, which I also love, and both of those programs are being removed at once, or at least in this case, cut in half, potentially worse. Um, that's all I needed to say. Just, uh, I've had many, many parents over the years ask me, why don't we have an eighth grade program? And I have a feeling we're gonna get a question from our sixth graders, why don't we have a seventh grade program? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. My name is Dr. Muradian, and I have, can I do a question and comment combined? He'll be less than three minutes, don't worry. Um, number one, my first question is, what, how much do we spend on sports? Just just a ballpark per what, year. What, just what's your relation district, just? I'm a student here. Student. Okay, that's. Just a ballpark information. How much do we spend on sports? I, I don't have that off the top of my head. You don't have, is it in the millions? Okay. You're welcome to email us and we'll find out the answer and we'll get, and we'll get it to you. Yeah, I'm just wondering, cause you know, I feel like we put a lot of emphasis on that and maybe not enough emphasis on other parts of our education. Uh, my second question is kind of like this little rumor. I feel like we have a little expenses that we just like throw around there. I don't know if we still do this, but I know that there was this company that came with dogs that chased away the geese and you would pay thousands of dollars for them. And now most of our money is turf and I haven't seen them in a few months, but I'm wondering, are we still paying them? Do you think maybe that's where some of the budget could be cut off on like little expenses like that? Maybe taking away from some aspects of sports, maybe not just focusing in on special education and TAs. Cause let me tell you, my brother, he's special ed. And I know the whole two, two teacher thing, right? Gen ed teachers do not know how to handle kids with special needs the way that TAs do. They really don't. My brother, he'll have, you know, a routine will go off. Yeah, just you can't go into detail about it. Okay. You, know, you just got to talk in broad strokes. Somebody with autism, right? A routine will go off. Teachers, gen ed teachers are not specialized or handled to fix those situations and deal with them and help them in the ways they need the help. The TAs are. They specialize in that. They deal with kids who have special needs. Gen A teachers, they don't, they don't know what they're doing when it comes to that. And I think it's a shame. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Herber, and I have two children at Muncie Park. I'm back. Uh, I'm here in support of Manhasset Excellence, which is a group of parents who have asked that the district form a committee to relook at selection, transparency, and flexibility of the advanced placement programs, starting with math and science. Now, uh, they did this through an online uh, petition that garnered over 250 signatures, and I'm one of the people who signed. The advanced placement section process is deliberately and unnecessarily um, limiting access to higher level classes, and it's compounded, the problems with it are compounded by a lack of flexibility that really um, limits students uh, through high school in accessing the most advanced pathways. We believe there are solutions and mitigation strategies that the district could pursue, but administrators won't engage. Therefore, I will share what I heard discussed among these parents in this forum, and um, and here's what they said. Well, are you, I'm just, I'm sorry, Ms. Herbert. Are you asking a question because are you asking, or are you just stating what's something that you heard? Like, are you asking a question in regards to the process or are you making a statement about the progress process? Because 
I just want to make sure that you're talking to us. So we're aware of the conversations that were, that were took place. Good. Um, do you know what parents want? Yes, we are. We are in full conversation. Yes, ma'am. Am I able to make my comment, even though I don't have a question? Now, I mean, in regards to what took place in that meeting, we realized what took place in that meeting. So I'm just, I just want to see if there's new information that you want to present in regards to the subject that we've spoken about. Um, yeah, there's some new information. New information. Okay. Okay. So can I get the rest of my three minutes? There's, if there's new information, yes. Okay. So, um, what parents want and, and, what I heard was uh, earlier differentiation in math in elementary school, no skipping curriculums for entry to advanced programs, no biased teacher rating systems, no cut uh, COGAT cutoff for consideration to the program, no hiding of the results of the selection process, more than one section of advanced classes per school, and taking grade eight classes out of the high school GPA calculation. So these are the things that parents are talking about. And uh, these suggestions are no cost because I'm sensitive to the budget uh, discussions of today. And they can be accomplished with, um, in, no matter what the fiscal environment is really, because the curriculum materials already exist and the students are shifting classes between classes. Like one, adding one class of AP is just one class elsewhere. So um, ManhattanExcellence.com website has shown a light on the problems and the possibilities for our advanced placement programs. And our administrators have closed the door to discussions but this petition was directed to the administration and the board. So for that, um, I just wanted to say, you, you know, you're not a rubber stamp. I'm asking um, the board to be the checks and balances that you're supposed to be. Your elected leaders um, and at least 250 parents are asking you to form a committee. So just to engage on topics that matter to us and that have the potential for, to better our students and our district. So I'm asking, this is the question that I'm asking, is please override this short-sighted and inexplicable decision by the administrators to close the discussion. Authorize a committee, this is what I'm asking, this is what the petition was asking, to authorize a committee to relook at the advanced placement programs. Imagine the problem of having too many students and parents who want to pursue more educational opportunities at no cost. Imagine a district that won't embrace that in desire, that desire and won't address a petition and won't even form a committee to explore the opportunities. Why? Is it a belief that what we have is working? Because over 250 parents have spoken about the need for improvements. And excellence comes from harnessing our collective passions and resources. And I urge you to capitalize on that and set up a committee of the administrators and the parents to explore our advanced placement program process and pathways. We can do better and our students deserve better. That's the question. Thank you. Anyone else? Mariana Bruno for Children in the District. I guess the question I have relates to um, financial. Were there any contracts that were up or due for renewal where you could have put out for bid to try to either address some economies of scale or find cost savings? I found in my experience, in my profession, background, when you have contracts that are up for renewal, it's your opportunity to potentially push and pull and get some cost savings. So were there any contracts that were up for renewal, for, for example, consultants, attorney fees, I hate to say this, landscaping, like you name the gamut. And it was very difficult to hear the conversations. You guys know me as striving for academic excellence. And so when I hear budget cuts could potentially impact not only children with special needs, but also will have an overflow to general education students. So contracts that potentially were up for renewal, anything that could have been looked at? Yeah, we have a, we have a board policy on, uh, on that. And so of course, acting in accordance with the policy, there are several uh, engagements that are annual engagements. And um, we typically budget uh, based on what we expect the expenses to be uh, based on actual usage during the, during the time. So the rates between, uh, as an example, the prevailing rates from most of the services that you outlined before are pretty standard um, across, uh, across the firms that 
do that kind of work or the uh, agents that do the, that do that kind of work. So um, the budgeting process uh, is 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 one piece of the puzzle. The other the other piece of it is actually um, approving the appointments, and that happens annually each July, in accordance with the policy. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So looking on our next meeting, we'll be here in the district office April 4th. We'll have another informal budget hearing. Uh, and then on the 16th, the, uh, the board will look to adopt the budget and it'll become the board's budget. And on May 9th, we will have our formal budget hearing. Uh, motion to adjourn. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming tonight. Please get home safe. Thank you.